Um, this is where the elevation operator uh, worked on the Mark I Abel computer to direct the gunfire control system. Um, he was at a first class that was in charge of this computer that used to stand here. Another person over here that would work the, they didn't work the range, but they worked mainly the um, turning of the guns left and right in the direction of them. This is where if you had to make a correction, you would uh, have what they call a file call for fire mission. You would fire uh, uh, first shot out and then somebody out there would spot you and tell you, okay, you've got to go so far left, so far right, over or under. And this is where you would crank in the spots that would adjust the, the guns and uh, bring that call for fire on target. Okay. Tell that story about the Admiral. Uh, during Vietnam, they developed a uh, new type of five-inch gun projectile. It was called a, a RAP projectile. It stood for a rocket-assisted projectile. And essentially what that did is, is it took the projectile, which would normally go 18,000 yards, which is equivalent of nine miles, since 2,000 nautical yards is a mile. And this essentially pumped that up to almost a 50% increase. The problem was the Mark I Able computer uh, was not designed to work with something that could shoot that far. When you have to go that far a distance, you have to take into account the curvature of the earth. And what would happen is you'd have to make adjustments to the computer and let, rather than let it run on its own. So you'd have to crank in spots and change it. And we had tested it a couple times in training, but we got over to Vietnam and we were going to actually, we knew we were gonna shoot it, but we didn't know when. Turned out the day we shot it, it was when I was on duty at this machine here. And uh, my first class was, was standing there, and I can't remember who was here. And then in comes the Admiral for the Pacific Fleet, who just happened to want to stand here. And then the captain of the ship was all kind of nervous standing behind him. And so we're all ready. Everybody's here to watch, and we're going to test the system. And so we fired one round to see where that would go. And it was pretty close. So all we did is, is it called in and had me adjust. I think it was a 15 mil spot come in there. And my first class kind of looks at me and gives me the look like, is this going to work? Because we have a lot of company watching us. And uh, I gave him the thumbs up like I really knew it might work. <laughs> and anyway, we cranked it in. It took one spot. It was right on target. And then we went to fire for effect. And everybody was very pleased. That's basically that story. Uh, tell me a little bit about this. This, this is a Mark I Able computer. It's, um, I think it's built by Ford, I don't know. The thing that got me about this computer was when I came on board, this computer was older than I was. And when I came in the Navy, they told me how I was gonna be working on this new technical type stuff. So it, it always amazed me that I worked on a computer that was older than I was. It's basically made of, of uh, gears and servos and electrical mechanical devices to, to do all the computations. So all the mathematical formulas are in the form of, of cams and, and gears in there. And it's very stable. It works really well. And you do a series of tests on it, probably twice a week, to make sure everything works. But you were very careful when you input all the stuff because there's a little slop in all these things. And there's a little slop in the gears and stuff. And so you had a range tolerance for the operation and once as long as you were within the range that tolerance range you were fine and it would work very well it would account for all the problems you needed if I got out of that range then you had a problem because you had to go inside and once you get inside a screw could loosen up or, or a nut or anything that would cause it to go out and it was very difficult to troubleshoot so um, we would run a series of tests over and over to make sure you know it wasn't a testing problem versus a computer problem but it's very stable. I think it's common throughout the Navy. They were on destroyers and all over. And that way you could bring another fire control technician on board and he wouldn't have to learn all over what it was. I mean, this essentially is the computer part. You talk about the, the range information here. Um, I'm trying to remember what this is. This is, this is the base of the, the area that control the elevation controls. And this, if you had to crank in a spot or something, you would use these dials to crank it in and, and make those adjustments. And you could lock them down with, with this type of stuff here. Just crank it in to where you want it, and then it would lock in. And that would hold it. Or you could crank it in and it would engage and move the, the gears up here. So essentially that took of that. And you could take into account your adjustments and, and set fuses here and stuff like that. Most of that was done automatically. Um, that's pretty much this area. This is where the as I recall, it was the elevation operator, we called it. 
Um, the person that was in charge of the range was your first class, and they would stand on that end. It could be an E5 that would stand over here and operate it. And here are your ranging dials, and then here tells you where on the ship the gun's pointing, the direction of the ship, everything. If you have an air target, you would deal with this area here. And this would talk about the direction that the gun mount itself was pointing. It's going, um, you know, to the left or to the right or port or starboard or whatever. Um, basically, that's the system. This other unit down here, the other end right here, this is, is the, the gyroscope. Inside, there's a, there's a gyroscope. And what it's going to do is it's going to take your ship. And if you would look at the ship when it was shooting, you would see gun, barrel, gun barrels going up and down like that. In reality, what's happened is the gun barrel is still and the ship's going up and down. And what the gyroscope does is it puts it all on a level plane and it keeps it there. So then you don't have to account for that. All you have to worry about is range and elevation and, or, you know, turning to the left or right or, or your elevation to get your range to make it work. Um, essentially, this computer has ability to shoot and direct and fire any sh gun on board the ship. You have a, a control switch over here that tells you essentially forward and aft. That would tell you which which plotting room had the duty or which um, to do the call for fire missions. And that would be switched here and that controlled the communications into it. You have two computers are identically the same stations. Um, again, they could control any, any gun mount on the ship, including 16 inch battery. We had the ability to shoot the, um, the uh, main battery as well as secondary battery. All these little panels over here control what ship or what computer is operating. For instance, this one is talking about the computer number three, which I believe was this machine here. And it would be connected with, in this case, director number one. Well, director number one is, is the one on the front of the ship. Okay. Now, down below, you would be telling it, um, you could set it up with what gun mounts you want to use. You could run the turret from here just by the setup based on what, what was uh, turned on and what wasn't to what position. Or you could set it up where this computer had the number three director and um, two or three gun mounts on the starboard side. That computer would have the aft director, two or three gun mounts on the port side. The, the front plotting area would do the same thing. So you could set this up any way you wanted. We, I think at one time we tested it out to determine, yes, we could shoot 16 inch guns back here. That was not the norm. Normally you've got a, a four and a half plotting room that's designed to take care of the bat, uh, main battery. They can do all the uh, um, plotting and computations that they need. They have the charts because it's, it's, it's more serious for them to deal with the charts. And then they have to take the information that's called in from the spotter and input it on the chart to bring it on target. But now again, we've got essentially two of these facilities on board the ship. You have a main battery plotting area there that controls that. And they have the ability also to control the five inch battery. With, with their controls there in terms of the computers. There, we have two of these plotting rooms on board the ship. The main battery, secondary battery here. Forward toward the bow of the ship, you have a similar situation. The layout's a little bit different. You still have two computers, but instead of facing this direction where we're going like from, you know, across the ship, their setup is set up the other way, going fore and aft. And I really don't know why that would be, why, why they chose to do it, but that's something else they chose. But you have the ability, again, through the, the switch panel here to control any of the guns and tie it to any of the directors if you were going to use a director in that. Or if you didn't need to, you could crank in the points for doing shore bombardment or wherever you needed. Most of the shore bombardment information would come in through the radio phone that would be next door. You'd have a radio operator here, and he would be in touch with the spotter on the beach that would call in the corrections to your fire. So initially, you'd shoot one around or two out there first. They would determine from that how far or what correction you would need to. What correction you would need to um, adjust your fire to bring it on target. But uh, I was fortunate. I got to serve on the ship from when it was first commissioned in Philadelphia until we decommissioned it in, in Bremerton approximately two years later. In that period of time, we took the ship through the Panama, down the East Coast through the Panama Canal 
We made a trip to Vietnam, went over there and did some uh, shore bombardment missions and brought it back. The period of Vietnam was, was kind of a period of, of contrast for me. I thought, well, I'm going to combat, I'm going to war. What is that going to be like? Um, it turned out to be a really con a ex different experience. Um, it was not uncommon to have uh, the ship have a what they call a call for fire mission. So half the ship forward be, uh, would have the duty, and they would be shooting um, call for fire missions over on the beach. People would call in and say, "We've got somebody moving in here. We need some 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 help." And so we'd, we'd fire in there and, and send them wherever they need. And it was really ironic because you could be standing out in the back of the ship doing your normal stuff, look up, and the front part of the ship is shooting rounds and. 16-inch round is big enough that you can track it in the sky. You can see it going. And on one occasion, we're off the coast of Da Nang. And I'm looking over there looking. And what I have is we're shooting over the trees to a call for fire mission. There's a, a bunch of trees right there. And then, and then there's also a beach area in front of here. So we have guys on the beach, sunbathing, doing whatever. We're shooting over their heads. And in between us is... Uh, helicopters strafing the trees for snipers or whatever they were doing and it just seemed bizarre because all these things were going on at the same time um, okay and so a normal work day would, would be half the ship doing the call for fire missions doing storm bombardment whatever they needed and the other half the ship would be doing whatever they had to do maintenance or painting or clean the decks or maybe hole installing the decks or whatever and the next day the other part of that would change we did during the night have, have watches that we would stand. It'd be like one plotting room would have the duty one day, another one the next. And so you, you'd come on, um, come to work in the middle of the night, mid-watch or whatever. And our shifts were different. I remember one occasion, and it was about eight months, that I really felt I was in a combat situation. I came to work um, in the forward plotting room at about two o'clock in the morning. We were up near the DMZ and the North Vietnamese, or Charlie, were making a big push. They were coming over big time. And all of a sudden, we started getting these call for fire missions. We were running two computers. One computer was running star shell, which would illuminate the target area for the spotter so they could see what was going on. Another computer was shooting five-inch high explosive missions. So we had it's either two or three mounts. So one mount's doing illumination. One mount is controlled doing high explosive. And then a 16-inch battery is shooting at the same time, too. And they're calling for just about everything we can do because they have another destroyer out there, um, field artillery. It was amazing. There was one person spotting for all this. Anyway, we fired from about two o'clock in the morning, just straight through to close to seven o'clock noon shift. We, we expended thousands of rounds of ammunition. I have no idea how much it was, but there was one time during that period of eight months where I felt I was really involved in something in terms of combat. Um, so it was an experience of contrast. One thing I do remember, and it was always encouraging, is we used to bring the, the, the soldiers that had been in the field and in the jungle out. They'd come out here and they'd helo them out to the ship and they'd have three or four days of R&R &R and wouldn't get charged for it. They'd just get them out of there. And um, it was very comforting to know that when the New Jersey was in the area, the guys in the field said, we would have an easy night because Charlie knew you, was here, you were here and he wasn't going to do anything. He knew if he tried to do something that night, he was, it was going to cost him. And so he said, if we knew you guys were in the area, it would be quiet. Nobody would be doing anything. So that, that felt good to hear that. You felt like you were contributing. Um, that's basically it. Yeah. Okay. The switchboard is very... Pardon? Switchboard is very useful, probably for something you wouldn't consider. This area, because of the machinery, is kept pretty cool. So it could be really hot outside and it wouldn't be too bad. And if you wanted to get some sleep and you couldn't upstairs where it was too warm, it was real easy to crawl behind the switchboard, lay down your blankets and pillows and just sleep for hours. So a number of us used to do that just to, to uh, because it was so much cooler. You didn't have to deal with the heat. I have one story to share with you, um, and it was while the ship was in Philadelphia. It was even before we got going. Uh, an, another fire control tech system, myself, took off and, and went. We spent the, we're going to spend the weekend in New York City, and 
you hear a lot of things about how people involved in the military then weren't well received and how people treated them really bad. But anyway, we went up there on Friday night and went out and did a little party and then we're standing at the Y and pretty much blew our money. Well, Saturday we spent that day hanging around Central Park and, and seeing a lot of stuff. And then we found this little bar and we're sitting in there talking and we met a gentleman who happened to be in the um, National Guard. And we're talking to him and he said, you know, what are you doing? Well, we're just kind of hanging out here. We have not much to do. Anyway, he broke a date with his girlfriend, came back and picked up my friend and I, and, and it's a true story. He took us to the Playboy Club in New York City. He bought us dinner, he had filet mignon. Just had a great time. I got a little, I got drunk. They took me back to the Y and those guys went out and had a good time. But I've always had a good feeling uh, about the people in New York City. I remember we were standing in Central Park and there was a pro-Vietnam pro demonstration going on, an anti-Vietnam demonstration going on at the same time. I remember just standing there, we're in uniform and kind of wondering if we should be here. And here's this cop, it's about six foot ten, and he looks back it up and he starts going, he says, isn't this fun? You know, it was just really relaxed. So. Anyway, I just wanted to share that.